Hi, my name's Dale, and welcome to Metal Tips and Tricks. We are now in the fourth episode of a DIY project I call DIY Spindle Square. Great name, isn't it? And this is part of an entire series that I'll be working on over the next few years called Build It, Use It. And that's where I build something like that and show you how to use it. Today, we're working on the fourth episode. The first one was I showed you how to build it. Second one was showed you how to use it. Third one is we pimped it out and made it look cool. Now the fourth episode is we're going to build a protective box for it. Right now, I love Purple Heart. And Purple Heart is actually a hardwood. First time I used it was probably about 30 years ago. I was building a guitar. I used it for the fingerboard and also the binding around this acoustic guitar. Turned out beautiful. Now, one of the other things I like about Purple Heart is there's certain characteristics I look for in a hardwood. One is I want it to be stable. I don't want it to change a lot. Number two, it has to be beautiful. Three, it has to actually be hard. Four, it has to be consistent. Some hardwoods, uh, the grain changes, the, the uh, hardness changes. This here is an incredibly stable material. And the fifth one is it's cheap. It's actually probably one of the most affordable hardwoods you can buy in North America. This is one inch thick material that I glued together. I don't know if I can show you. Yeah, here we go. See how I've got the grain set up here on the end where it's kind of a book match? This is when it glues together, the wood stays more stable because the expansion and contraction um, cancels each other out. If I would have had the arcs of the grain go in the same way, well, this wood could cup and bend over as it changes over the years. So we want to make sure we could keep it stable. Now we're going to square this up all on the milling machine. I know that's going to freak some people out. I'm going to probably hear somebody tell me that this is going to damage my milling machine. Guys, that's, well, I'm going to start an argument here. That's ridiculous, okay? I put steel in here. That damages this thing more than this wood ever could. Now they'll talk about, well, the wood gets in the ways and whatever. Steel gets in the ways. You know, one of the great things about using wood in a milling machine is it operates, well, what I want to say, kind of like cat litter. It gets all over your machine. It absorbs all the oil that's been just soaking on it, and it gets rid of it. So <laughs> that's a terrible analogy to tell it's like, cat litter, like they throw cat litter all over my machine. Well, I don't do that. But what I am trying to say is it's actually a great way to get your machine clean, to, to, you know, cut some wood on every once in a while. The sawdust, like I said, absorbs the oil, wipe away the sawdust, you have a cleaner machine. The other thing is we're going to cut this with a fly cutter. I've got a carbide tip cutter on it right now. If I could only have one cutter on a milling machine, it would be a fly cutter. I can change the profile of the tip on this cutting edge and do just about anything I want to it. I can have small ones, I can have large ones. It's an incredibly versatile cutter. So we're gonna square this up. This will probably become the most square piece of wood ever in America. Boy, that's a bold statement. I'm just joking with you guys. Very easy to square up. We're gonna bring it over here. We're gonna touch off. Remember, we're cutting wood today. We get to have a little bit more fun. We get to speed it up. Oh, let me get some safety glasses on. Be back in a minute. We're going to go for stylish goggles today. What do you think? That makes a great cut. It's interesting how I'm still so used to working with steel that I was scared to put this in there. It's sticking up so high. Um, I didn't want to make as deep a cut, which the real truth is none of those are a concern. We're working with such a mild material. Let's bring it over to the other side. We're going to just simply put our square in. Good. I am squaring this up so this corner is my hero position. This is number one. And the reason I'm doing that is I still have to do the layout of how I want to fit 
the spindle square to this block of wood and then come back and square the other two sides. Okay, I'm getting a lot of tear out on the back of this. I'm gonna do an old woodworking trick to resolve that. Tear out is caused when the material cannot support the blade coming through and hitting it, and it folds it over. It's kind of like a burr on steel, but on, when it happens on wood, you can see here on the end how bad it tears out. And really what I should do is do this end and then this side to help prevent that from happening. And I'll probably do that off camera, but let me show you this trick first. I'm just gonna take a piece of wood, support it from behind. Now that wood is gonna give that edge the support that it needs to do this, to keep that edge from folding over. So it looks like I'm gonna have to take off a good three eighths of an inch. Much cleaner, much better. I want to show you something I was also doing while I was cutting this as an experiment. I was moving the wood in and out to just see what was happening. What I was trying to do was get the sawdust to be pushed back and not at me as much. But when I did that, because of the way the cutter was coming into here, it was coming in at a more shallow angle like, shallow angle like this, it was tearing this out here. So you want to get a good strong approach so when that cutter comes into the wood, it hits it and cuts it in and doesn't leave that. Now some of you are going to ask why I didn't cut in both directions to save time. And there's a great reason for that is when this cutter is coming around this side, it's throwing the sawdust in that direction. When it's coming around this side, it would have just pelted me with the sawdust. And I didn't want to do that. And I'm going to finish this off camera and we'll see uh, you over at the work table in just a few minutes. We're now over at the bench and we're gonna figure out a layout and how this whole machine is gonna fit in here. And it's not that difficult. Remember, we're gonna use the milling machine to mill this all out. It's the easiest way to do it. You could do it with a router. Well, it would be a lot of work. And the milling machine, I think, is just perfect for this. This is also a milling machine project, even though it's wood. I think it's still the best way to do it and it's kind of fun. If you don't like that I'm using my milling machine, as a router, that's your problem, not mine. Don't want to hear about it. Don't need any trolls saying you can't do that because I'm going to show you wrong right now. What we want to be careful about on setting this gauge up inlaid into this box is, well, the goal is to keep the gauge safe. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that the gauges themselves don't get bumped around in the box when we're putting it in the box, taking it out of the box, or just moving the container itself to another place. So we want to have the gauge and the probes down here suspended inside this container. Mill out so it all sets and rests on the horizontal and the vertical post. It's very simple to do. Some of the things I've had to do on the back here is on these gauges, do I have one? Let me pull one out here. There is sometimes an extra support here for mounting to a holder, whatever you have. Well, they kind of get in the way of the box. You'd have to make the box extra deep so you don't hit those. I just cut them off and then filled them in with epoxy. Worked out really well. We're going to simply lay this out. We're going to give about an inch all the way around. Now remember, I've only milled two surfaces here. So first of all, 
we need to figure out where our lines are for when we take it back in and square up the rest of this machine. I'm going to set this up to about one inch. We're going to see where it comes over here and mark it. Same thing here, we're going to mark about an inch. See where we line up. Come off the top. The fun thing about working with wood is we have more margin for error than normally in metal. So we've got this set up of about a one inch. I'm going to simply just scribe this here. I'm going to do it with a ballpoint pen so you guys can see it easier. We need the gap to be about an inch and I'm going to give this a little extra tolerance or I should say lack of tolerance. I'm going to open this up about a sixteenth of an inch per side so about an eighth inch total. And the reason I'm doing that is wood does expand and contract. We don't want this wood to shrink in and tighten in so we can't get this out. Next we need to find the center. Okay, this is nine and three eighths. Center of that would be four and a half, three sixteenths. The material here is three quarters of an inch. So we need three eighths of an inch each side. inch from the top. What's fun about a project like this is when it's in the milling machine, if it's too tight, we just reroute it out. It'll be very easy to do. We're going to come in here, mark the ends. Going to give them just a little extra space. We want to make room for the probes now. The probes, again, we just need them to suspend a little bit. We just have to make sure we have plenty of room for them. Good. Now, the critical one. Remember, we're going to make these gauges float inside here. What I really need to do is identify where the center is, and it's very simple to do. We're going to just come in right here to the gauge. We know where the center is because that's where the uh, needle pivots. Bring it back up, line it up again. Which center should also be for these two. Huh. A little bit off. We're gonna need to double check that. That one seems to be good. Okay, X marks the spot. When we cut this out, we're going to probably use a fly cutter to do that. Very simple, it just drills down, we're done. We want to give enough room for the little knobs and appendages here so they don't interfere when we're setting it into the case. Another clearance area we need to make is we're going to cut out a couple little divots on each side of this so we can reach in and pull this out. It's kind of like playing what was that electric 
uh, doctor game. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. Well, it's kind of the same idea. We need to be able to pinch down and pull this out. Uh, let's see, what else do we need to do? We need to talk about how deep this is going to go. And remember, we want to make sure we don't rest any of the gauges in this box on the wood. So we're just going to take, simply take a depth reading here. And it is about an inch and a sixteenth. We're going to, let's make the depth of this one one and one eighth of an inch. This vertical rod insets just a little bit. Let's measure that. That's an eighth of an inch. So this here will come out to one inch. I think we've kind of got our layout. Oh, we got to talk about some other things. We're going to put a hinge on here. So we're going to want to inlay the hinge just a little bit and then get it to set in there. Other things is we're going to use a couple of these uh, great rare earth magnets and we're going to probably put two of them, two of them in here and that will hold the lid shut. So this is all going to be milled out all the same size. And right now our material is two inches thick. Well we don't need the full two inches. We're going to end up cutting off about three quarters of an inch right here. This piece is going to come over to the top and become our top. And the reason I haven't cut that off yet is when this is all squared up and done, when I cut this off, it'll be the exact same size as the rest of the material. Let's now head over to the uh, milling machine and go to work. So I've made some changes to the milling machine. I uh, switched the uh, jaws around on the vise. As you know, the jaws can fit on both ends. The, the holes that were sitting here, they're actually fixed drain holes, so you can mount the vise jaw on the end, and also the other side to expand the capacity. The other thing that works out great is this anvil, I think you would call it an anvil, kind of acts as parallel, so when I put the wood in, it's tight, secure, and also level. We're going to use three different bits to cut this out. I've got a bit here, it's an inch, inch and an eighth. I've got a one inch, and I also have a half inch. And that's going to do all these depths here. Then we're going to have to cut a couple circles for the tops of the gauges. I'm going to put on my eyewear. Now, you know, these are very fashionable. And you know, the difference between good fashion and bad fashion is having the confidence to wear something stupid and still look cool. Okay, to work. I'm going to line up the cutters on each end of the lines, come over here, and I'm going to set a zero, and we're set. And when I get over to this side, I'll just visually cue it in, and I'm sure I'll be close enough. I want to set our depth. So we talked about going down an inch and an eighth for the total depth. I am going to set my gauge here. I'm already set at three inches. I know I'm going to have to bring this down to four and an eighth. Very simple. I did that by just simply raising the knee up, raising the whole table until I got to my mark. Oh, let me stop for just a second. Now, I'm using, of course, a mill in cutter. And a mill in cutter is not really the best for this. If you look at uh, router bits, the shanks on them are straight and there's a reason for that is when they cut, they keep from burring the edge. Where this here will pull up, so as it's cutting, it's going to pull up on these edges and it may cause me some problems. I know this is a sharp cutter because I just sharpened it, so let's see how it performs. So we're definitely getting some burning here. I'm going to go to a different speed. I've got a two-speed motor on here. So let's go to the slower speed and see how it does. 
bring it up to zero. Much better, don't you think? You can still see I'm getting some real bad tearing on the wood, but I think that'll stand out pretty easy. I'm going to take the risk and go both directions. Now I'm taking about a quarter inch cut each time. And this will be my final. I'm going to go down to one and an eighth. It's definitely a little scorched in there, but I don't think it's going to bother anything at the end of the day. Let's see how we did for tolerance. I think that works for me. I'm going to switch out bits. We're going to put in the, uh, what do I have here? Seven eighths. Let's put it in. Now we're going to have to touch this off. We're going to line it up just like we did before. We're going to line it up left and right to these lines, just match up to the cutter. So I just lowered the table a little bit to line this up to three inches. And that's going to be my touch off mark. We're going to take this down to one inch total, where this one here is an inch and an eighth. This is going to be one inch, one inch and that's to allow for the differences in the diameter of the shaft to the main crossbar. Remember our fashion. That was a boom. There. There. I think we've got a really good lineup here. Let's cut these here and switch out the cutter. Now this of course doesn't have to go as far. Oh, if we look at this, we're about the halfway line, three quarters. I think if we drop this down three quarters of an inch, it'll be just right. I'm going to line it up a little differently. Since it looks like I messed up these lines, I'm going to center this cutter this way. So I'm going to look to see where that tooth is on that side and on this side and line it up. Cut in a quarter of an inch. All right, let's see how we did. Got plenty of clearance for those tips. Well, this is so cool. Now, since I've got this in place, I am going to just draw about the size of where the gauges are, just to get a reference. I'm not really sure how this is going to work out. I'm going to make room right here for the hinge, and then I'm going to mill this out so I have a place to put my fingers to pull out the gauge. Okay, this is a limiting opening hinge. It'll only go so far. Okay, let's get a width on this. So you can see how we've got that. I 
I'm going to use this half inch cutter to cut that and it's going to give me round corners here which is fine. I can chisel those out and make them square or I can round these over and I think I'm going to round these over but we'll find out a little bit later. I'm going to be a little deeper than what I should be but I think by the time this gets resurfaced and sanded down I'm going to be good. So let's get back to zero, turn this on, make our cut. Pretty good. Next we're going to route this out here and we're going to do another route here and we're going to go to a round over bit. So I misspoke. I'm not going to use a round over bit for this. I'm going to actually use a uh, bull nose bit to cut out here. So it just gives a nice indentation in here. This again is another one of those bits that I paid nothing for. I, I actually got it at a pawn shop. With my previous video you kind of saw my success with these type of bits. Well, I feel let's push it. Okay, this is a time to learn from my mistakes. You know, like I've said before, a smart person learns from his mistakes. A smarter person learns from somebody else's. So I want you to learn from mine. I should have making that cut first before cutting out for that shaft, and I may have prevented the splintering that I'm getting back here. That'll all have to be hand worked later, but for right now I'm not going to concern myself with it. Come over to the other side. Actually, it would have been nice. I could have used this for that whole channel. Ah, oh, do you believe it? I don't have enough depth, enough depth to make that cut. So, this is time to take advantage of sliding this head out. I don't get to do this very often. Oh, that's slick. Yeah, that'll work. Again, this is splintering out. I'll have to do some hand work on that, just like the one back here. Now, let's get set up for the gauges. I've changed out the bit. I'm, you know, as you understand, I'm just kind of ad-libbing this as I go. I find this more as an experiment that's just kind of fun to do. So we need to router this out, and I'm going to do it two ways. First, I'm going to do the majority of the work that I want removed with this half-inch cutter. Then we're going to come in with, I was going to use a fly cutter, and I went, well, why not use a boring bar? It's the same thing, just have more flexibility in adjusting it. So I'm going to come in here, just hand route this out and see what happens. This is where I could have used math to figure out the whole circle and develop that diameter. Or if I had a more modern digital readout than this one, um, it could set points and I could set how accurate I want. But you know something? Sometimes you just got to ad lib and have fun, let the mistakes go as they will. You can see this is going to be quite a bit larger and it's open. I know that because I'm going to pretty much make a larger diameter than the gauge. So this is going to be fine here. Let's go to the other one. Wow. 
definitely learned some things on this second one. It worked out a lot better. One of the things you want to look out for is I was milling one way and then I'd test the other way and see which way the wood would tear out and then I'd go in the more favorable direction. Now, so once again, I've changed my mind. I was going to go in with a um, boring tool like this, but I decided to stick with a fly cutter. And the reason I'm going to use a fly cutter is not everybody has a boring tool like that. And fly cutters are just so simple, so easy. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to line this up again. The measurements on this aren't super critical. One thing you do want to make sure is your cutter is very sharp. This one's carbide. This is actually a better opportunity for steel. Um, high speed steel can actually be sharper than carbide. It just doesn't hold the edges long. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply just eyeball this. We've got to make room for up here. This is going to cut in right here if I keep with that diameter. But I've got to keep it up there. Now I have a choice. I can keep this centered where it's going to cut in to this area here, which isn't, it's not the end of the world, but it's, I don't think it's ideal. My other option would be to reduce this down by size so this cutter lines up right there, comes around, has enough room up there. And I think I'm going to do just a little bit of both. I think I'm going to cheat it a little bit. I want to make sure that's going to clear. Come around to this side. Boy, it's still going to be in there. Let's bring it in some more. Now, I do like systems. Once I loosen one, I, you know, I need to loosen all three. When I tighten, I tighten all three at the same time, even if I'm going to go back and forth. I do that so I don't forget. So I'm approximately in the middle of that groove with the face of that cutter. Bring it back here. We're going to line it up. I don't know how this is going to work out. Okay, so now we can see how much more I need to mill out. Let's go over to the other side. Well, you know something? The sides aren't too bad. I think I went a little large. Since this is all about experimentation today, let's keep experimenting. If you're not confident with doing this, like I've said before on other projects, don't do it. Um, I'm taking a risk here, but hey, maybe I'll get a good video out of it. Pretty cool. Let's bring the gauge over, see what happened. That's working pretty good. Then we can go to oversize. So we know where zero is there. Now we're going to expand this bit out. Now, if I was really a smart guy, I would grind this so it was flat on the bottom. So when it hit the bottom of the hole, it would actually be flat there. That's good. All right, let's do this last one.
it's kind of a personal preference to how you want to step this up. I'm still a little tight up here, so I'm going to clean that out. I'm going to clean up some other things. But I'm going to do that work off camera, and then we're going to work on the lid. As you can see, we're on the final stretch of finishing this project. This has been a lot of fun. And I want to just kind of go over the lid just a little bit. I don't want to go into too much detail, but let me show you what went on. Is I had to cut it off on the bandsaw. And the reason I did that is I wanted this top piece, when turned over, to fit onto here more accurately, and it's an easier way of doing it. But another more valid way, or just as valid a way of doing it, is to start out with um, three-quarter inch stock. I start out with two pieces of one inch, glued it together, made it a total of two, cut off the lid, which is a little over, that's probably about five-eighths, and cut that off on the bandsaw. But you could have very well have just gone in with three-quarter inch, glued that together, giving your base an inch and a half total, and then put three-quarter inch on top. And I would have done that if I would have had three-quarter inch material, but I didn't. Now you can see, after using the bandsaw, you get a very rough finish. I had to resurface this and did it with a boring head. Set up a special boring bar on it to give it an extra wide sweep to cover this entire surface in one cut. The cutter that I put in it had just a little round bull nose on it. Worked out really, really well. But I must say, it's not a great way of doing it, but I did it just for fun, just to see how it'd work out. And as you can see, it worked out really well. It's flat. <laughs> just that was the goal. Just didn't save a lot of time. Let's talk about the finishing. So after everything's done, everything's milled out, of course, you have to sand it. And I use a palm sander for the larger surfaces, also round to the corners that way. I went in with a little detail air grinder with some different types of cutting heads on them to finish out the inside and also some other little things. And it's just kind of whatever you have on hand to finish it, that's what you work with. I sometimes like to, when I'm going into finishing wood, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. One is you can stain the wood and then put a varnish or a lacquer or a shellac over it. And it's a great way to do it. And actually, I prefer it. That's a more high quality finish. In my opinion, it shows a lot more of the natural grain in the wood than what I used here. A way of cheating is to go in with a varnish wood stain. And the word stain, let's say, I'd say that's an embellishment. It really doesn't stain the wood, what happens is the finish itself, the varathane has the stain in it or the coloring. And it's a semi-translucent finishing. So when you put it on, you really can only do about one coat because the next coat is going to fill in everything. And therefore, when this is done, it looks more like a solid metal box because none of the grain will come through, none of the colorations will come through. So it is a great finish to brush on one time. Sand a little bit, maybe you can put a little bit more on, but it is, you know, it has its limitations. But I do like it, especially for a project like this, that is going to probably get, I want to say, a little bit of abuse. It's not in my house. It is in my shop where, well, it can take a little bit more abuse. Great way of doing it. <clears throat> now, some of the other things I had to do on this to make it so I could take the gauge out of the box is I had to knurl this top spindle or the top shaft. And the reason it had to be knurled is I couldn't get enough grip on it to pull it out. So I just did a quick knurl on that. It turned out really, really nice. Added three stripes to it, just like the three stripes in the base. I also put an extra hole here for my finger to fit in so I could easily pull it out of the box. I had a viewer, Bill Yester, sent in a photograph of the gauge that he made, and it is excellent. You know, I said this is your creative art project, 
and he definitely took it to the next level, and it's wonderful. Now, he matched me on the curves here, which I think was beautiful, but then he took it to the next level by the circular holes that he drilled into it. I just, to me, I think that was just a fabulous twist because it matches the gauges here. I think he did a better job on it than I did, but that's not the point. The point is he took his project, made it his, and it's excellent. So now let's get to what a lot of you have been waiting for is the giveaway. Okay, here is the date that is going to be the final giveaway. Well, let me back up again. Here's the email address. And on the seat, send me an email and you could win this whole thing, box, gauges, everything for free. All you have to do is send in to this email address your name and your address, and you'll, have, you'll be entered into a drawing to win it. It's that simple. Now, there is a deadline to the drawing, and here's the date for that. Get your email out. Send it to me. Trust me, I'm not going to do anything with your email because I wouldn't know what to do with it even if I knew anything about marketing. It's just my way of keeping track. Now, this is something, if you send me an email and it doesn't have your address on it, I will go to the next person. And it's kind of like you have to be present to be there. Well, I need address because I'm not going to do an email back and forth to find out address to who to send this or I need to make it nice and simple. I hope you guys appreciate that. So here we go. The DIY spindle square in a box, pimped out, ready to go. All right, guys, Till next time. Go out in your shop, build something cool. Thanks. Just like I did with the other bit, is I did a depth of a thousand, uh, 70 thousand, I did a depth of that, 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 that. I did a depth that was a lot. I did a depth that was um, somewhat deeper than it was.